You brought up David Stanley. And uh, I, that, so it makes me want to ask a question I was thinking of later. But I like, I like David Stanley. And I think historians should like David Stanley. Not because he's necessarily a good general. <laughs> but because he's a very grouchy person. <laughs> and he writes everything down. Um, so he, uh, Stanley is the source of many of the really juicy negative uh, tidbits. He's, his, uh, uh, his complaints about General Sherman are very illustrative. Mm -hmm. But does this create, for a historian, what is the challenge this creates where someone after the war who has particular problems seems to be grinding an ax. Does that make their, their evaluation? Yes, in, 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 several, in several instances. And that's why uh, this is, is a collection of quotations, and I caution the readers that you have to go, and I provide the, the source from which it's drawn, and I, I urge anybody to go to the original source and take it in context. There was not, it would be a lifelong endeavor to try to explain all these uh, relationships or, or cause and effect of why why I'm taking a shot at you. Uh, after the war, as General Gibbon wrote, when, when the guns stopped, then the, then the real fighting starts. And you pick up your pens and you start attacking each other. It would have been this way if only you had done this, or <laughs> if you had supported my left, or if you had supported my right, things would have turned out differently. And so the battle of the books after the war is really fascinating in itself. But the contemporary accounts are, are better in terms of their historical uh, believability as opposed to maybe legend or mm -hmm. coulda, woulda, shoulda uh, history. Uh, so that's part of the problem. And, and if you're somebody as fortunate as James Harrison Wilson to outlive everybody you're writing about, <laughs> you can say whatever the heck you darn well please because there's nobody to refute you. And, and one of the victims of that is, is uh, General Warren, mm -hmm. who the people who assassinate his army career then write these abominable things about him right after he dies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have to know, it's like walking in a minefield for the historian. If you want to use this, you better understand what it is and what it means and why, what the motivation is of the person saying it and the relationship of the recipient of mm -hmm. Luke David Stanley's vitriol. <laughs> now, what are some of, what, as an example, what are some of the types of sources for the quotes? One of the post-war memoirs, Post, is, well, 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 see, I, 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 number one, again, this is such a, it, this could have been a 42 volume work uh, <laughs> if I had started 112 years ago. But I, I wanted to pick from sources that are readily available so that the casual reader could access the source and, and check it out in some depth. Uh, I, I stayed away from the archival stuff just because it's impossible to, to go there on a regular basis. So I use memoirs. Uh, post-war memoirs. I use letters and diaries of the, the soldiers themselves. I use staff officers' accounts, some war correspondence that now we'd say were embedded with the Army. But mm -hmm. some of them were with the Army, somebody like, like Dana, who was also the uh, Assistant Secretary of War, or Sylvanus Cadwallader, who wins the prize for the most bizarre name of the Civil War. <laughs> and uh, people like that shaped the public's opinion of these generals and the things they wrote. So I felt they were important to include. And then, of course, politicians, they have a way of getting involved in everything. And since they made and broke some of these generals, I let some of their opinions get in there as mm -hmm. well. And so th the basic thing was to give a broad-based, uh, a many-faceted view of some of these generals from their peers, from the people who made and broke them, staff officers who are their official family, uh, but also something that any one of us could go to and get reference right away without having to travel to the New York State Library at Albany or Springfield, yeah. Illinois or somewhere. All right. Margaret, you, you mentioned hospitals before, what they were and, and what they became. And you have a chapter that, that focuses on one particular hospital. Or, and so uh, we're gonna, you talk about Satterley Hospital in Philadelphia right. and how that uh, is an example uh, so could you tell us a little bit about Satterley and why, of all the hospitals that were created, why that one is worth taking a careful look at? Well, often historians end up talking about the thing they have the most sources on. <laughs> um, it's like the, the joke about the guys looking around under a street light and he can't find something, somebody comes along, what are you looking for? Well, I dropped my keys over in the bushes. <laughs> well, why are you over here? Well, the light's over here. <laughs> and, I, and that just comes through over and over again in history. 
there was a newspaper at Satterley. They had all these, these printing presses to print hospital documents, all those mm. forms that had to be filled out. And they had lots of guys who worked for newspapers that were in the Satterley, there was four or 5,000 beds at Satterley. It mm -hmm. was easy to find a newspaper guy. So they started printing a newspaper for the hospital. And that gave me all sorts of inside knowledge about it, which was, was nice. I got some patient perspective as well. It was a big hospital with lots of letters going to and fro, so it was easy to find patient letters. Mm -hmm. A lot of big name doctors were there. There were published books and histories of it. Um, it saw some of the big events. It got uh, more than a thousand patients, I can't remember exactly how many, from Gettysburg, for example, and so you can follow what happens to them. Um, and then it is emblematic of many hospitals in the North, these so-called pavilion hospitals that were assemblages of these long, narrow sheds, um, two or three bed wide sheds that were designed for maximum airflow to follow Florence Nightingale's hospital plan. And they built, this was a brand new built hospital just for the war. And so it's exemplary of many other hospitals. Okay. It's not that it was necessarily the greatest, the best, the largest, but it was like many of the others. So I found it very useful. Okay. Well, it's certainly a, uh, it, you point out in, in your book that there are differences between hospitals. And of course we have, I'm gonna ah. <laughs> grab this print of the Pry House Hospital at Antietam. <laughs> and uh, and you've already seen it. It's it's a yes. print by Keith Rocco, nineteen ninety four. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the uh, some of the differences between Satterley and the Pry House, between a frontline hospital sure. and what's going on? Well, this Satterley was a so called general hospital. This is some place you would end up after um, you've been sick or wounded for some time. Whereas on the front line, like the Pry House, this would fall under the general category of uh, field hospital. Now, this is at Antietam. Um, two days before the Antietam battle, this was a, a mill, I think, actually. But others were barns. They were just a farmhouse. But the, the doctors taking care of the wounded after the battle has happened set up a station. Um, they're doing a immediate surgery. They knew you needed to amputate a shattered limb within 24, 48 hours, so they set up an operating table, um, a place for um, the men to get out of the rain um, or to get out, you know, whatever the weather is, maybe get warm, be laid out, be in front of the doctors. So field hospitals often reflected the chaos after a battle. They might even just be in the shadow of a rock that had some defense. But the general hospitals is where you'd get taken to, you get taken further and further from the lines if you're not immediately, you know, they wrap it up and you go back to your tent. But um, general hospitals would be, a recovery area would be well behind the lines in Philadelphia, Annapolis, D.C., um, and then in the West, in Chicago and St. Louis and Louisville and Cincinnati, um, behind enemy lines, I mean way behind, not behind enemy lines, way behind Union lines, safe, recover, hopefully go back to your regiment. There's a, an account of one of the soldiers that, uh, whose memoirs I worked on. At, he got deathly ill at Shiloh uh, right before the Corinth campaign after the Battle of Shiloh, like most of the Army did from the bad water. And okay. his pards tried to take care of him. There was a reluctance to go to these True. field hospitals. Afterwards, he ended up in one of the uh, recovery hospitals in Keokuk, Iowa. Okay. Do you have any, what, what kind of commentary of soldiers about their treatment in places like this? Not necessarily soldiers that had been wounded in battle, but those who became sick on campaign and were almost invalided out of the army. Well, the, there's different opinions about that. The regiments had their own hospitals. And if a regiment is stationed somewhere for a period of time, they, they get all settled in. They pitch their tents. They might even build uh, structures, wooden structures. Um, they set up their regimental hospital. And men preferred to go into that hospital, get taken care of by their own doctor that may be from their own hometown, and then they get better, they go back to their, their regiment. 
Um, but then the problem came when the regiment moves and has to go on. So those men then would get sent to some next higher level hospital. But Joe Glatthar, for example, argues that the men liked the regimental hospitals the best because their own buds could come, hang out, bring them something to eat, sneak them some whiskey, whatever. Pass the time of day. <laughs> Pass the time of day. Yell at the doctor that he wasn't paying enough attention to their friend, you know, that sort of thing. And, and patient advocacy is important. Um, the squeaky wheel, you know, the usual. But then when they get sent further and further back, they're in the hands of strangers. On the other hand, they may get better care. So, you know, it's a more stable environment than being in some tent. Uh, you know, it's, you're in a building, for example. So it could, could vary. The soldiers at Satterley, from the publications and the letters, were pretty satisfied. What they didn't want to do was go back to the war. <laughs> that just showed sanity. <laughs> yeah. Or they wanted to go home, but you know they weren't hating the hospital okay. by and large. Well, speaking of the of the Pry House, okay. Pry Hospital and Field Hospitals. Here's one of the denizens of uh, temporary denizens of that field hospital, and one of the important uh, personages of the Civil War, and that's Clara Barton. Here's a signed photograph of Clara Barton from a little later in her life. You see she's got that brooch with the Red Cross on it in the photograph. The Red Cross was not, she did not found the American Red Cross till many years. Right, 1882 after. I 1882. think. 1882. But there she was in the Civil War and she mentioned that the Civil War had a lot to do with advancing women's rights. So right. where, where do women gain a role in in Civil War medicine and in these hospitals, and how does that come about? Well, one thing to remember is that women provided most of the health care before the Civil War. Doctors might come in, just, just as you do today, you take your kid <laughs> to get the strep throat treated, you see the doctor for five minutes, and you go home for five days and deal with this child who's mm -hmm. sick and cranky. Well, the, um, hi, Will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, Women were the health care providers for most everybody except the poorest. And so when the war starts and these hospitals are getting established, these male doctors and male officers of various sorts are setting up hospitals and think they know how to set up a sick bed. They don't know that men need pajamas or whatever, you know, night shirts. It's, it's other people who come in and say they need clean sheets, they need uh, something other than their dirty woolen uniform to be lying around sick while they're having diarrhea and throwing up and bleeding. Um, they need a cup of water. They need somebody to give them water, to get food in them. No, they're not going to eat hardtack and uh, salt bacon while they're sick in the hospital. They need hospital foods. So women pushed in and through various means, sometimes on the front lines, it was obviously more difficult, although Clara Barton went there and other women went there mm -hmm. providing relief, or to become nursing staffs in those more settled general hospitals on both sides. In, in the South, the war obviously came to women's front lawns, mm -hmm. and you know there are these men, they're bleeding, they go out, they help them, and it, it might be as simple as that. So Clara Barton was upset with the care men were getting in the immediate aftermath of battle and set up her own sort of relief stations. Um, she didn't get along. She was not a lady who got along real well with authority and the uh -huh. structure of the Union side, but she did a lot of very good work there. Um, and then does eventually found the American Red Cross. And the American Red Cross initially was about battlefield relief um, and it only later expands to the Johnstown flood and that sort of thing so she wanted civilians to be able to safely help uh, in the aftermath of battle